I mean, the breadth of the use of this material, like we need plastic for the internet, we need it for our computers, for cars, clothing, toys. It is a material that's absolutely entwined with every facet of living today. And yet we know that it uh, is a problem in the environment and we know that it's toxic to produce. So there's these kind of two ends, both in the making of plastics and in the disposal of plastics that are really dangerous for uh, ecosystems on the planet. Hi, I'm Kelly Jazvac. I am an artist and a professor in sculpture at Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. I'm Patricia Corcoran. I'm a professor at the University of Western Ontario in the Department of Earth Sciences. I'm a sedimentary petrologist. And that means I basically study sedimentary deposits in order to gain an understanding of past climates or past anthropogenic activity. So not only do I look at natural grains of sediment, I also study anthropogenic grains like plastic. My research interests involve the history of plastics both in sculpture and contemporary art, but also in terms of the environment. And I'm really interested in what our roles could be in discussing issues like climate crisis and environmental pollution. Plastic is the name given to a group of synthetic or semi-synthetic materials that are actually created from natural products like coal, natural gas, and oil. And plastics are considered polymers. And what that basically means is that they're repeating units in a chain of monomers. Polymers are difficult to break down because the, the repeating units make them very durable chemically. Because they have such a long life cycle, it tends to make plastic persistent in the environment. One of the first types of plastic was actually made as part of a competition to come up with a material to replace billiard balls. And so if you can imagine how durable a billiard ball is, uh, what the design to be that replacement material must be. Production really started to ramp up around World War II. So there was all sorts of war-based reasons, for example, uh, access to rubber or things like even pantyhose, silk uh, pantyhose was replaced. So there was a race to invent nylon or something that could replace the silk. After World War II had ended, there was this new consumer economy that suddenly could benefit off all the, the thousands and thousands of products that can be made with materials like plastics. I had invited Charles Moore to give a public presentation. Kelly heard about this talk and came to the presentation. So after the talk, I sought out the person who organized the talk just to say, hey, I'm really interested in plastics pollution as well, in case you want to collaborate. And that person was Patricia, and she was extremely open and friendly right from the get-go. Charlie had shown a slide of this material that he had found on the big island of Hawaii. And he didn't know what to call this material, but it looked like it was composed of sediment, but it was also composed of some organic material, and it was also composed of plastic. And so uh, he said during the talk, I've been trying to get a geologist to come out to the island and, and have a look at this. And I, I said, I'm a geologist and I would love to go and look at this material. And so when Kelly had sought me out and she said, I will go to Hawaii with you. Part of what I did with this material that I knew I would find on the beach was we had to measure them. We had to measure the length and width. We had to document them. We had to photograph them. We had to collect them. We had to actually take coordinates like latitude and longitude where each fragment was found on the beach. Uh, we had to make observations. It was so visual. Like it was, it was, I felt immediately like, oh, okay, I know how to do this. Like just looking for something really specific and describing it visually. I definitely knew that this was going to be something that we could write about and we could publish about. It's shifted. So first we thought, oh, it's a story of how and this was what Charlie proposed. It was a story of how Mother Earth takes care of its own issues by um, melting this plastic from actual natural volcanic eruption. And it changed. And Kelly said something to me when we were driving. She said, what can we say about the Anthropocene? And I thought, geez, I had, I had never thought of that. And then we just started talking and it, and it became more of a bigger story to us than natural melting of plastic. It became humans are using the plastic. Humans are producing the plastic. Humans are consuming the plastic. Humans are 
throwing away the plastic and then humans are burning the plastic and it's all preserved in something that is so difficult to break apart now and becomes buried and it, and it becomes part of our, our stratigraphic record. There's so many benefits to being part of this group. It's difficult to just think of one. I would say working with people from another discipline and a very different discipline when I say to people, yep, I work with visual artists and I am a scientist and they think, well, what, what do you have in common? Like, what are you doing? And I think that where my work naturally leaves off, then their work begins. And that's how I thought of it in the beginning. But then it became, no, nope, we're enmeshed. We're, we're going to be enmeshed from the very start. If I think about a project that we just recently published about plastic pellets across all five Great Lakes, and we sampled 66 beaches. We were all trained in what we were looking for and how we were going to do it. We had a whole database of each individual pellet. And it took a long time. It took a year to actually characterize these. And and I had my students working on it and me, but, but we also had visual artists working on it. And then from that point, we got statisticians involved and it's just, it just kind of steamrolled because there was so much that we could do. And now, you know, on the other side of it is we have the results out there and then, then we get to this exhibition. The exhibition is called Plastic Heart Surface All the Way Through and it will be held at the Art Museum at the University of Toronto in fall 2021. As part of that exhibition, this research will be featured, but so will other angles into discussing this uh, issue around the Great Lakes. And so we have historical artworks, for example, made out of plastic in the region. We have some new commissions by contemporary artists who are responding to the theme and making new works. We have artists in the Synthetic Collective who are responding to the sampling experience. And then we've also commissioned a data visualizer, Sky Moret. She went through the pellet paper and considered ways to uh, represent the data in, an, in another visual way to make it understandable to audiences. Also, the goal of the whole show is to do it all as environmentally sustainably as possible. I think it's going to end up looking like quite a different show because of those sustainability decisions. I mean, I think it will be quite experimental, but it might also offer for some interesting models uh, in terms of how to make exhibitions in the future. I think it's really important for artists to have a really full understanding of where their materials come from. I think making art in a time of climate crisis now requires that of us. So I feel really lucky to get to work with Patricia and her team because I'm learning so much about every phase of this material that I'm working with, both from how it's made to what happens to it when it ends up in the environment. Artists, sometimes we can be in take mode where we're just we're just looking for what we can get out of, out of something to, to further our practice. And a rule I had for myself that I had to also make sure I was in give mode a lot in this collaboration. And so there's things that I do that I feel aren't gonna be artworks in the end, and that is totally okay. The biggest way that my life has changed since I've been studying plastics pollution is that I've been engaging with communities. And through these communities and through public outreach, I've been able to actually educate people on the different things that they can do instead of you know, always having plastic as a constant presence in their lives. I think the main way that this research has influenced me is empowering me as a political citizen <laughs> to, to advocate, to vote, to inform myself, to know that, uh, yes, consumers have some responsibility, but also know that it's very convenient for industry to blame the consumer. As it stands now, recycling is not the solution. The, the amount of waste going into the environment is so high that no recycling scheme ever devised will be sufficient to fix what we're facing right now. The collaboration that we have as artists and scientists, it's not only necessary to include those two disciplines, and I think we need to also bring in social scientists and we have brought in government workers who can influence policy. It's not enough for us to do the research and publish it and, and do some outreach. We also need to um, affect change. And I think a big part of that is actually to work with government agencies and to work with 
the uh, plastics industry. So what I would like to say <laughs> to architects, <laughs> and this is thinking about architecture in a really broad sense, so not just like building a building, but thinking about systems and flow of people and materials in a civic space, is what an architecture of care might look like. A way to build structures that care for the inhabitants that use them. And so that is not just humans, but all facets of, of creatures that might be implicated by both the materials that go into it, how they use the space. What might a longevity plan be when thinking about architecture as a, as a potential site for care?